Hello there guys, it's me and Stable Voltage, and welcome to the second episode of Europa Universalis 4. We're playing as England this time, and trying to form the English nation, well the British nation, we're still at war with France in the 100 Years War, but we've pulled all of our troops back, apart from our ships, which are just blocking everybody in port, and we're essentially just going to let them go ahead and do their thing, because we're not too worried about that. What we do want to do, of course, is try and take over some of Scotland and Ireland where we can. So, we've got this army here. We can actually still assign them a leader because we still have Richard Neville kicking around. And what we're going to do is move both of these armies up onto the uh, Northumbrian and Cumbria borders. Uh, which means that we will be able to dogpile into Scotland very, very soon. Now what we do want to happen is the war with France to end as soon as possible. We're already starting to get a little bit of a negative war score with them. And that is because um, they are starting to siege some provinces out. So we're just starting to move our units through. Now some units might get a little bit of attrition along the way because some of these areas do have lower supply limits. But that's fine. We can manage that quite nicely. So our two diplomats are currently tied up in trying to fabricate claims against Scotland and Connaught respectively. So the supply limit on both of these provinces is fine to support two stacks of 18 troops. We haven't got to worry too much about that. What I might do before we actually uh, start the war with Scotland, and Scotland know it's coming because they must have been running at low maintenance. Because what happens is if you reduce the maintenance cost of your army, and you can do that by going in to the um, economy screen, if you drop the maintenance of your army, it lowers their base morale. Now the green bar will still show as being sort of full because it's as full as it can be for whatever you've set the base to but it does save you a lot of money per month however what happens then is when you go to war or when you put your army maintenance back up to full you you're not at full full morale it takes time for it to get back up to the to the base so it looks like scotland were running at low maintenance and all of a sudden they've just put their maintenance up because now their morale has just suddenly taken a drop. So they, they're probably looking at these two um, armies on their border and thinking, oh dear. And they should. So what I was about to say is hopefully the war with France will be finished before I take on Scotland. Because what I'd like to be able to do is move my um, ships up here. And I was going to do it to try and pen their fleet in. Because they've only got um, uh, two heavies and four transports. But they have now decided that they are going to leave port. There's not an awful lot that I can do about that at this time. Uh, we'll just have a quick look in the ledger and have a look at Scotland just to see what they're like um, units wise. Uh, they only have a total of 6,000 units with 10,000 men in reserve so they don't have an awful lot of tool, uh, at all. In fact that army that we saw is their total fighting force currently. So as soon as uh, France managed to siege out those provinces, and hopefully once it gets down to about minus 10%, we'll just see if we can wipe peace out and uh, have as little damage to our nation as possible, which will put us in a better position to try and deal with, um, with Scotland. Now, we are making a little bit of money. I'm very tempted to go ahead now and actually hire at least an administrative advisor because one thing that you will find with England and I think this happens with a lot of the nations particularly in the early game is you do get a lot of annoying random events that drop your stability and you never want to be in negative stability it's really bad for you and in order to bump your stability up outside of random events and missions it actually costs you administrative power so if we actually have a look and see what we can get here, well we don't want the level 2 guy because we simply cannot afford him. He's going to cost us 4 ducats per month and we're not making that. So we can have a level 1 guy and there's 2 to choose from. Uh, we've got one who will give us some inflation reduction yearly but we don't currently have any inflation and we have one who will give us some national revolt risk reduction. Now I don't think we have much national revolt at uh, the minute but we'll take him anyway because we will start getting some as we start to take out the various um various nations now apparently we have a national decision available we have the option to pass the advancement of religion act and the reason that's available is because we have a theologian so just because we actually have that guy in administrative office gives us the option to um pass this act now what does it do what does it give us 
So if we choose this, it will give us the Advancement of True Religion Act until the 2nd of January 1821. So essentially until the end of the game. And what it basically does is it, it gives us a little bit more National Revolt Risk, but it also gives us a little bit more Missionary Strength. Now, that is something that's quite useful. We don't mind a little bit of National Revolt Risk because we've just picked up a guy who gives us National Revolt Risk Reduction. And the reduction he gives us is minus three, and we've just picked up plus one. So we're still at minus two. So he's very good to have. I wonder what else we've got down here. Uh, Papal State, uh, more than 30 ports. Um, Sing Britannia rules the waves. I mean, that's one that's very specific to the English or the British. Have more than 30 ports. Have uh, 50 or more heavy ships and have 50 or more light ships. And that gives us the option to get naval leader maneuver, which is very good because it means that if any of your navies have an admiral on board, the ships can move a little bit faster and they get much better positioning in naval battles. Um, England are very, very good when it comes to uh, sort of ev everything navy. So whether it's trade or whether it's naval warfare, if we actually look at national ideas and see what the English have, um, they have a Royal Navy, uh, which basically means uh, heavy ship combat ability plus 10% and yearly naval tradition is 0.25% increase. Uh, naval tr tradition also increases your ability for trade steering as well, which is something I will cover in another video, but that is quite important for making money. Uh, then you've got the uh, Eltham Ordnance, which is basically a 15% positive to the national tax modifier. Secretaries of State, you get an extra diplomatic relation. Uh, Navigation Acts gives us 10% to our light ship combat ability and actually gives us a national trade income modifier of 10%. The English Bill of Rights is minus one to the national revolt risk. The reform of the commission buying gives us 5% to discipline. And then the uh, Sick and Hurt Board gives minus 25% to our naval attrition. So England become very, very strong at sea in the late game. Let's unpause things and let things continue on. Now we've got a new pop-up here saying that we can invest in a cardinal. Now car you can invest in cardinals if you are a Catholic country and we are if we actually click on england you can see that our, well if we click on individual provinces it's easier to see if we actually just uh, left click on london you can see that our religion is catholic in fact there's a religion map mode button which is t and if you actually zoom out you can see where all of the different religions are you've got sunni you've got orthodox shamanist uh sunni's down there the Ibadis down there but we are most definitely catholic and any country or any nation that is Catholic can invest in the Holy See. So you see these two buttons down here next to the minimap. Uh, this one is the Holy Roman Empire button. Now we're not actually part of the Holy Roman Empire so I'm not going to talk too much about that but just in brief the way that the Holy Roman Empire works uh, you can take part in this if one of your uh, provinces is part of the Holy Roman Empire so you only need one province in the Holy Roman Empire to take part. The uh, HRE has an imperial authority, it's the emperor, the person that is in charge, and at this point in the game it is Austria. Now there are also seven different electors, these are the people who get to choose who the emperor is. And then there are 49 princes, these are basically all the countries that are part of the HRE. Now any one of these countries, any one of these princes can be elected as the emperor, if they get the majority of votes from the electors. So if you do have one of your provinces in the HRE and want to take part in that, what you want to do is start sucking up to the electors and get a really good opinion, or have them get a really good opinion of you. That way there's more chance of them electing you. And then what happens as the emperor, you gain something called imperial authority. And you actually see here how uh, the, the benefits from it. There's your imperial authority. And it tells you how you get this imperial authority uh, by honouring the calls of members. So if someone needs help, if they're being attacked, you go and help them. Winning defensive wars against foreign powers. Member states converting to the one true faith, which is Catholic. Uh, liberating member states. Forcing non-members to release a member vassal. Provinces joining the empire. Success emperors from the same country all of those things increase your imperial authority and you lose it by not going to help out your members that are at war by provinces leaving the empire and by states converting to a different religion so 
there is more ways to gain authority than lose it. And it does give you a certain benefit being the Emperor. You get better offensive spies. You get more uh, advisors. Uh, you get um, a, an extra leader without upkeep. You get an extra diplomatic relation. And the Emperor may take f uh, following diplomatic actions. that They can instow imperial grace, they can enforce religious unity, they can grant electorates and demand unlawful territory. And they also have all these reforms. Now, in order to put these reforms through, they do have to meet certain conditions, but they do give certain benefits to the Empire, such as decreasing build costs, increasing prestige, decreasing technology costs, and so on and so forth. So the HRE does become very, very powerful. But what we're interested in is is the papal seat down here and we can actually see that the uh, current courier controller is actually Scotland. Now the courier controller can do a couple of different things. They can actually excommunicate which means they can kick somebody out of the um, out of the courier but they can only usually do that to someone who is um, who who has a bad influence, a bad reputation. So if you don't have a bad reputation, they can't really do that. Uh, the other option is to call for a crusade. Now, you can't call for a crusade against other Catholic nations, of course. But if you call for a crusade against um, uh, another uh, religion, you'll actually get sort of... Um, a bonus to your combat ability against them. You get uh, CBs against their territories. It just makes it much easier if you want to go and say you wanted to go down here and sort of fight Morocco or something, who's uh, or the Sunnis. You can call Crusade now. We gain a certain amount of papal influence um, every month, and it shows you here how much we get and what causes it. So some of it is by the papal state's opinion of us, by our prestige, our religious unity. That's where most of it is coming coming from, and our base tax and buildings. So. These are the current active cardinals. Now, whoever has the most active cardinals controls the Curia. Now, at the moment, everyone only has one, so it's it's equal. Someone has to be the Curia controller, and in this case, it is Scotland. So what you want to aim to do is there are always five future cardinals, and you can invest points into them to try and get them to be on your side. Now, what you can see... As you can see how old they are, you can see who has the current highest vote for them and how much um, papal influence has been invested in them at this point. Now ideally you want to try and vote for the people who are youngest because sometimes future cardinals will actually die before they've ever been um, sort of promoted to an active cardinal and then all those points are essentially wasted. It also means that if they do manage to become an active cardinal they're probably going to live longer before they die and you have to replace them. Um, so if we actually have a look here, the youngest is 40, but he's actually got some um, influence with the papal state. They're actually up to plus 10. So let's see if we can pick someone down a bit further. We've got uh, this guy here, who is only 46. Now, he has five influence from Burgundy, and I'd prefer Burgundy not to actually um, become the... Uh, Curia controller. So I'm going to um, vote for him. Now, I could left click here to spend five points of papal influence, which I will do, but it still leaves Burgundy in control because I don't actually have enough. You have to go over by five to knock them off the top spot. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this button here, which turns on automatic spending. So whenever I get the points, it will automatically spend them on this guy and try and beat Burgundy to him. So that's enough waffle about that, but it is very important um, having that. Uh, at least in the early game. Later on, not quite so important, but it will be later. Now, let's have a look and see how things are going. Um, our agent was discovered. Now, we actually had a diplomat over in Connaught who was trying to um, fabricate a claim over there. Now, he has been caught. Now, that won't actually stop him. He will still be over there and... Uh, carry on fabricating this claim. The downside of being discovered means, first of all, we actually lose uh, some reputation with Connor. They're not happy that we are fabricating a claim against them. Uh, and the second thing is we do get a little bit of aggressive expansion. Now, aggressive expansion doesn't really... Um, aggressive expansion is more potent closer to home. So the aggressive expansion will be highest with the likes of uh, Tyrone, Leinster and Munster, a little bit with Scotland. And as we move further into Europe, they will care less and less about that aggressive expansion. Um, there used to be somewhere where you could actually see your aggressive expansion with everyone, but I think it's done on individual uh, cities. 
Uh, border frictions, is it that one? Yeah, aggressive expansion. So as you can see, our aggressive expansion with Connaught is minus 14, uh, and it will increase by plus 2 yearly. So it does fade away over time. So it's 14 with Connaught, but if we look at Tyrone, it's also 14. If we look at Munster, 14. Leinster, 14. Now let's look at Scotland, 11. If we move over here and look at Burgundy, um... It's 12. So as you can see... Okay, what's going on here? We have been informed that our agent in Lothian has been discovered by Scotland while fabricating a claim in Aberdeen. So again, uh, we've now been discovered in Scotland. If we look at Scotland now, we can actually see that um, their aggressive expansion with us is now 25. And it's probably affected these guys over here a little bit as well. Yeah, they're at 20. So the closest, the closer it is to home... Uh, the more effect it's going to have. But again, it does disappear over time. So who's going to be done first? He's 38% through. Scotland, 74.5%. That's going on quite nicely. Going to speed the game up a couple of notches. Maybe move it up to speed uh, three. Just let some time pass so we can start trying to fabricate through these claims. And we're still making money, which is very good. Actually tempted at this point to go in and consider getting a diplomatic advisor now because we are doing fairly well. So what we could have is better relations over time. Or Again, we're not going to look at the plus two guy. We can't afford him. Morale of navies, which we're not really using. So let's go for better relations over time and that'll help patch up some of the issues we have. How are we doing in the war against France? Oddly enough, they still haven't managed to siege out any of these territories yet. They're working on it, but they haven't quite got there at this point, which is a little bit annoying. But we'll leave them to carry on with that. And we can actually see the hostile sieges over here on the right-hand side on the... Um, on the outliner so let us speed things up a little bit again we'll go up to speed three we now have an heir to the throne philip has been born he's a one 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 leader which isn't fantastic but it's certainly better than henry at this point so we're going to one pause again go back up to speed three it's good that we now have an heir it means that we won't go into uh, if, if your king if your monarch dies without an heir, one of two things will happen. You will either have a succession war for the throne, which is where another nation will try and claim the throne if they think they have a chance of doing it, which you can go to war for. Or the other option is you have what is called a regency council, where basically the nobles take control of the country until the heir is of age or until a new monarch has been put, of, uh, put in place. Um... We have now managed to finish fabricating that claim. We have gained the conquest Cassis Belli against Scotland. They hold provinces that we have claims on. Take Aberdeen. The war goal is to take Aberdeen. So now we have a CB against Scotland. We have a valid reason to, to fight against them. Uh, we can also see as well the um, Orkney Islands and the Shetland Islands over here. And even uh, these islands are all owned by Norway at this point. So the Scottish are having a little bit of a problem with Norway um, maybe we should get friendly with Norway because I don't think we're ever really going to be able to take Norway out though it would be nice if we could get these islands to be our own what is Norway's opinion of us let's just have a quick look at Norway um, they don't like us too much because of the aggressive expansion we could go and send a diplomat with them and try and improve our relations, but we need to keep one of our diplomats free so we can declare war with Scotland. And we'll also need to keep a diplomat free so we can have a peace deal with Scotland as well. Um, the war against France is taking far longer than I ever thought it was going to. Although, you know, the clue's in the name. It was the 100 Years' War. Historically, I can't actually remember the dates when, it's, when it started and ended, but... What will happen as soon as they get to a point where we can peace out? Let's just have a quick look, actually. If we wanted to go in and offer them a tribute, what would we have to give them to end the war? I mean, we could offer them Calais, which would be good, because then they'd have some French in Burgundian ter territory, and the, the Burgundians might go to war with them for that. If we offered them the ones down here first... So we could offer them both of those and that would end the war and that would mean we can keep Normandy and co which could be quite useful because then we would still have a foothold in um, in Europe. So if we were to negotiate that peace 
England would cede Labour, Gascoigne and Calais to France. Um, with a claim on the throne Cassius Balai, France gains 6 prestige and suffers 11.2 aggressive expansion relations penalty. And that is literally all it is. Um, and we actually gain some aggressive expansion, which is weird because we're actually giving everything, you know, we're giving land away. Um, aggressive, aggressive act will upset other countries by a base of plus 11.2. Now, as you can see, it actually has a list down there and you can see, oh, I think that's France's aggressive expansion. Yep, that's France's aggressive expansion. So France actually will get 15 aggressive expansion with the UK, 13 with Burgundy, 10 with Navarra, 9 with Brittany, so on and so forth as the list goes on. And they'll gain some prestige, but it shouldn't hurt us too much. So I'm going to go ahead and send that offer. Unpause the game. My King France has accepted our generous offer of peace. Uh, England will cede Laborde, Gascoigne and Calais to France with the claim of the throne. It's basically what we just learned before. And we now have a reconquest CB against Armagnac because they own provinces that we consider to be a core. Which of course is down here because if we go on to our diplomatic map mode we can see we actually have cores on these provinces so we already have a cb to go back to war with france should we need to we're not going to be able to do that for a while of course because we have a truce with these people which goes up until uh, 1456 so we're not going to be able to um, go to war with them for a while not without losing stability anyway but that also means they can't go to war with us either so we're now going to take this fleet of lights and we're actually going to help with the siege of Scotland. So we're going to move them up into the Tyne. And one more option that we have before we end this video here is we now have too few rivals. We get to pick some more. So we know we are rivaled against um, at France already. We are currently going... Now there's a, there's a limit to the ones you can choose depending on their size and power. We're going to choose Burgundy because Burgundy have already um, rivaled us. And then we have the options of Denmark and Aragon. Now I'm not too bothered about Aragon because hopefully they will get absorbed into Castile at some point and form Spain. Now if I want to try and make friends with Norway and Sweden who are going to be very big and powerful later uh, maybe I want to be against Denmark as well so let us pick Denmark and what we should be doing is making sure we are embargoing all of these people as well but it is going to take a day or two for our um, diplomat to come back uh, we have an alliance offer from Connacht, which we are not going to accept because we're about to go and steamroll them at some point. Uh, what we do want to do is we want to right-click on France and we want to go to economic actions. And we can't send a one to France yet because obviously we just sent a diplomat there for the peace deal. Um, so we want to go to Burgundy and we want to issue an embargo. So let us do that. And we now have a, another reconquest CB against France for um, lots of other places. Labourde, Gascoigne, Calais. That's fine. And they're moving some troops out of our lands. Just wait for that diplomat to return home. There we go. So now we can go on to Denmark and we can issue an embargo with them. Now... What essentially rivaling countries do is um, if you rival a country, you're more likely to get alliances with their enemies. You get an additional 25% prestige from defeating them in battles. You don't get a trade efficiency penalty when embargoing. Normally, if you embargo another nation, which hurts their trade, if you embargo another nation, you get a trade efficiency penalty. Because obviously, embargoing their trade hurts your trade. But if you're rivaled, it doesn't. You get an additional 20% spy offensive against them, and you get a 33% diplomatic power cost reduction from demanding provinces in a peace deal. And obviously, they get the same thing for declaring war against you. So what you should do is anyone who you actually have a... Um, anyone who you actually have rivaled, you should embargo them and that will actually affect their trade. And we'll talk a little bit more about trade in the beginning of the next video because we haven't really been doing any trade at this point, mainly because we've been at war. And I am going to be using my light ships to help with the Scottish war. But we'll just wait for that diplomat to come back.
Uh, I don't think he can go to France just yet. 25th of December before we can do that. Let's just speed things up a little bit. And those uh, ships have arrived where they should be. So 25th of December. And... Oh, we can't embargo during the truce. Well, that is fine then. So I think what we'll do, we'll just slow the game down. And we will just um, let it kick over to the new year. And we will move on to 1446. And then it'll do a little auto save. I'll pause there. And we'll end the video. 31st of December. And there we go. We are into the 1st of January and we are paused. So thanks a lot for watching, guys. Hope you are still enjoying EU4 and I'll see you on the next video. So until then, goodbye for now.